Please welcome Dr. Cristina Sanchez, the molecular biologist who discovered the anti-cancer properties of THC. My name is Cristina Sanchez and I work at Complutense University in Madrid, Spain. And I have been working for the last decade on the anti-tumor effects of cannabinoids. In the early 1960s, Rafi Mishulam from the Hebrew University in Israel characterized the main compound in marijuana producing the psychoactive effects that we all know. The cannabis plant has been known for millennia. After the discovery of this compound that is uh, called THC, it was pretty obvious that uh, this compound had to be acting on these cells, on our organism, through a mechanism, through a molecular mechanism. And in the 1980s, two specific targets for THC were discovered, something that we call cannabinoid receptors. And after the discovery of the receptor, it was obvious that our body has to synthesize something that binds to these receptors. It was pretty obvious that it was something endogenously produced, produced by our own bodies, that was acting through these receptors. And these compounds, these endogenously produced cannabinoids, were found a few years later, and it's what we call the endocannabinoids, because they are produced endogenously inside our bodies. These compounds, the endocannabinoids, together with the receptors, and the enzymes that synthesize, that produce the endocannabinoids and that degrade the endocannabinoids are what we call the endocannabinoid system. And we now know that the endocannabinoid system regulates a lot of biological function. Appetite, food intake, motor behavior, reproduction, and many, many other functions. And that's why the plant has such a wide therapeutic potential. We started working in this project uh, 12, 15 years ago and it was basically by chance. We were working with astrocytes at that time and we decided to change the model and work with astrocytoma cells, the tumoral cells. And we observed that when we treated these cells with cannabinoids, uh, THC, the main psychoactive component of cannabis, it was killing the cells in our petri dishes. We were killing the cells. So we thought that we were facing some potential anti-tumoral responses. And then we decided to analyze these compounds in animal models of breast and brain tumors. The results we have obtained are telling us that cannabinoids may be useful for the treatment of breast cancer. We started to do experiments in animal models of glioblastoma, brain tumors. And we observed that they were, cannabinoids were very potent in reducing tumor growth. Cells can die in different ways, and after cannabinoid treatment, they were dying in the clean way. They were committing suicide, which is something you really want when you have a, an anti-tumoral drug. One of the advantages of cannabinoids or cannabinoids, cannabinoid-based medicines would be that they target specifically tumor cells. They do not have any toxic effect on normal, non-tumoral cells. And this is uh, an advantage with respect of standard chemotherapy that target basically everything. When we started to see these uh, anti-tumor and cell-killing effects on cancer cells, we decided to set aside our metabolic studies and to focus on, on cancer. I cannot understand why in the States uh, cannabis is under Schedule 1. Because it is pretty obvious, not only from our work, but from work from many other researchers, that the plant has a very wide therapeutic potential. We are in contact with doctors in Spain, oncologists, neuro-oncologists and, and breast specialists that are willing to test these compounds in, in human patients. The plant, besides THC, produces cannabidiol. And this compound is very special because it is not psychoactive. It has been demonstrated that it is a very, very potent antioxidant. It protects the brain from stress and from damage, kills cancer cells. And when you combine it with THC, it uh, produces synergistic effects, which means that the effect of THC is potentiated. 
At this point, we have enough preclinical evidence supporting the idea that cannabinoids may have anti-tumoral properties. We, as researchers, should explore in more depth and, and, and be willing to, to try in many different pathologies. What is the evidence that marijuana smoking, habitual marijuana smoking, can lead to lung cancer? With respect to the development of lung cancer, uh, we uh, found no evidence of any increased risk of lung cancer uh, occurrence in association with marijuana smoking alone. The marijuana smokers, if anything, had a reduced risk for developing lung cancer. Not a significantly reduced risk, but reduced less than a one-fold. So that means reduced. Whereas the tobacco smokers had a markedly increased risk. If uh, the, those who smoked more than two packs a day had a 20-fold increase in the risk. That's 2,000%. Those who smoke from one to two uh, packs a day uh, had an eightfold risk, it's 800%. So, um, so that contrasts with no risk, no increased risk, or a slightly reduced risk with the marijuana smokers. THC actually has an anti-tumoral effect. And uh, these are studies that were done both in experimental animals and in cell culture systems. And for different kinds of cancer, for lung cancer, breast cancer, thyroid cancer, prostate cancer, gliomas, brain cancer, that the development and growth, or well, the growth actually of the tumor is, is suppressed by THC, and metastases are also suppressed. So how can that be? Well, THC impairs protein synthesis, and it's what we call anti-mitogenic or anti-proliferative. You need, so tumor cells don't as readily proliferate in the presence of THC. They're also uh, anti-angiogenic, so they interfere with the growth and development of new blood vessels that are necessary for metastatic spread. And they also are pro-apoptotic. What is apoptosis? Apoptosis is program cell death. So when cells age, there is a mechanism whereby the cells die. Uh, it's a non-necrotic death to die off the old cells and the we get rid of them before they have an opportunity to develop mutations that would lead to cancer. So enhancing apoptosis diminishes the risk of the cells becoming cancerous. So marijuana turns out, THC rather, turns out to be pro-apoptotic. So those appear to be the mechanisms that might account for these anti-tumoral effects of THC. We decided to do our own case control study. Funding from the National Institute on Drug Abuse, which is a major funding agency for marijuana-related research. This was the largest study uh, ever conducted on this subject. It was very well designed. We used the U uh, Los Angeles uh, Tumor Registry to identify, rapidly ascertain, all the cases of lung cancer and head and neck cancer <clears throat> That, occur, that were diagnosed in the LA County system. And uh, of course, by the time we got to some of them, they'd already died or they were too sick, but we got to it over 60% of them who agreed to participate and uh, were able to participate. And we administered this questionnaire and then we matched them to controls, the uh, same age, socioeconomic status, they lived in the same neighborhood using an algorithm that USC developed for this purpose so that we could match, you know, we're comparing apples with apples. And then we administered the, this detailed questionnaire, the food frequency questions, occupational history, all kinds of things. We also did molecular, uh, we got uh, a buckle smear so we could look at the DNA, could we look at the genetics of lung cancer. Uh, so what we did was to recruit uh, uh, smokers, heavy smokers of marijuana, um, at least uh, join a day for a week. And it ended up that the average smoker of marijuana whom we recruited smoked three joints a day for about 15 years. And um, uh, that's we also required that they smoke that much for five years. But on the average, they smoked three joints for 15 years. So that's about 45 to 50 joint years 
A joint year is, is the number of joints smoked uh, times the number of years smoked. Over the study population was, I think, be between 35 and 59. I think 35 was a younger age group. Which we thought that they had to be uh, teenagers in their early 20s at the time of the, at least in the marijuana epidemic, which you know was in the, in the mid 60s. So prior to that time, very few people used marijuana, but after that time, it just mushroomed up to 1979, which represented actually the apex, the acme of use of marijuana in our society. So that we, that's why we chose those age limits. And so what did we find? Uh, for any category of cannabis use, including heavy use, heavy use we define as more than 10 joint years, but we looked at 20 joint years and 30 joint years. For every category of marijuana use, the ratio was less than one, meaning reduced risk. It wasn't significantly reduced, but it was reduced. With, uh, and the confidence intervals were not that, that wide uh, around the point estimate. So there was no evidence, and we controlled for all the known or putative factors, uh, close for socioeconomic status, concomitant, tobacco smoking, alcohol, etc. At the same time, when we did a similar analysis for the tobacco smokers, there was a huge effect of tobacco. So I'm a cancer doctor and every day I see patients with cancer who have nausea from their chemotherapy or their cancer, loss of appetite, pain, depression, insomnia. And my experience over the past 30 years of being an oncologist is that there's one medicine that I could recommend to patients that can take care of all of those problems. Instead of writing five different prescription drugs, all of which have side effects and addictive potential, uh, I can tell my cancer patients to try marijuana uh, to take care of any combination of those symptoms. It's truly amazing uh, the number of conditions that respond favorably to cannabis. The number one condition is pain. Uh, cannabis uh, is useful in relieving people's pain. It's particularly effective in relieving pain from connective tissue disorders, from arthritis, from fibromyalgia, from systemic lupus, from reflex sympathetic dystrophy, a whole host of conditions that we don't really understand very well. People seem to get good relief from cannabis. Uh, people are able to decrease the amount of opiates that they're taking and in some instances to stop taking opiates entirely uh, for pain control. The first modern research that was done on cannabis was done in 1949 that demonstrated its usefulness in treating epilepsy. I have a number of people who don't have epilepsy when they use cannabis regularly. The founder of modern medicine is a physician named Sir William Osler, who was prominent around the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. He wrote the first textbook of internal medicine, and in that textbook, he said that cannabis was the most effective medication for the treatment of migraine headaches. And I certainly have a number of people with migraines who get substantial relief or even prevention of their migraines by consumption of cannabis. Other conditions that commonly respond favorably to marijuana include depression. Uh, it helps people with sleep. It helps their appetite. Uh, it's also very good in treating uh, GI symptoms, uh, nausea, uh, diarrhea. Uh, it's excellent for treating Crohn's disease. We did a little study of people with Crohn's disease and found that many of them were able to stop using steroids and stop using other medications that they had taken for their Crohn's, that they had uh, less diarrhea, they had less abdominal pain. It was a true miracle for them. Uh, there's a, a list here of conditions that was originally developed by Dr. Todd McCurea, who was a pioneer in terms of medical marijuana. He actually worked for the National Institute of Mental Health and his job was to give out uh, grants for doing studies on cannabis. Uh, he thought he was there to find out how cannabis was useful to treat medical conditions. Uh, NIMH thought he was there to hand out grants to see how dangerous it was. Uh, this was a marriage made in hell and uh, he did not stay with the National Institute of Mental Health uh, for very long. A cannabis is seen as a, a neuroprotective agent and we have found that it has provided benefits for people with multiple sclerosis. It certainly treats their neuropathic pain and their muscle spasm, 
But more importantly, people who were placed on Sativex, the tincture of cannabis, uh, in early studies in Great Britain have remained on it for years and years. And rather than progress, their multiple sclerosis has stayed the same, suggesting uh, that cannabis may not only be effective in reducing the symptoms, but also in slowing the progression of disease. It's helpful in dealing with the anxiety of people that have Alzheimer's disease. It's helpful in dealing with the muscle spasms that are associated with Parkinson's disease.